up another finger that we get, but that's okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, the research that uh, my lab has done around oil platforms off California, uh, beginning in 1995, and uh, basically the the uh, the impetus for um, uh, getting funding, and, and almost all the funding has come from the federal government. I will talk about that in a moment. The impetus comes from the fact that all platforms have an economic lifespan. And at some point, uh, the, the oil company that, that um, runs it, and there are various oil companies, they just can't make any money. And basically then they go to the federal government if the platform is in federal waters or the state government if it's in state waters within three miles of shore. And they go like, well, we're, we're done. We can't make any money. And uh, the process then uh, is what's called decommissioning. Decommissioning is done all over the world um, and follows various plans in the Gulf of Mexico where there are thousands of platforms compared to the 26 we have here. It's a well-oiled uh, mechanism and um, that is certainly not the case in California, where a number of platforms have really reached the end of their lifespans, their economic lifespans, and decisions are going to have to be made as to what to, to do with these platforms. Um, there are various things you can do with platforms uh, once they're no longer uh, economically viable. In California, only two things that uh, may happen. Um, the two things that can be done, you can totally remove them. Usually when you totally remove them first and always, you fill all of the wells with, um, with concrete. Um, usually we're talking 20, at least 20 or 30 feet of concrete below uh, the sea floor. And there's usually so little pressure left in the formation that the chance of of spill or leakage, I should say, it is not zero. Nothing is ever zero, but it's very, very remote. So that's the first thing you do. And the way you 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 remove a platform is you you lower explosive charges down the legs, down to below the mud line, and you blow the platform up or you sever all the legs. In doing so, you kill all the fish that are around it. And when you pull the platform up and put it on a barge. Uh, you then kill all the all the sea life. Um, so that's the process. What's going to be done in California is unclear. Now, the reason um, I got funding for for so long, uh, really up to to the present time, is that one of the factors that may play into what's going to be done with these platforms is the um, it, it is how these uh, platforms act as, as fish habitat or, or don't act as fish habitat. That's not gonna be the whole story. There's gonna be a lot of other uh, non-scientific things that go into it. Um, there are people, at least in the Santa Barbara area, have very strong emotions about the oil industry, uh, engendered by, much of it engendered by the 1969 oil spill. And uh, so there's a lot of hostility toward the oil industry. And um, so uh, eventually there are going to be public hearings on what to do and, and people then will yell and scream and, and rend their, their clothing and, and do all those things that people do. Um, so so uh, basically I'll go through a, a dog and pony show about what, what we have found. So um, this is platform Holly. Holly is located right off the campus and is the, certainly will be the first platform uh, that will go through the decommissioning process. Why is that? Well, the company that owned Holly went bankrupt and basically went to the state and said, well, you own it now. And then they scuttled away. And um, so the, the state in the form of the State Lands Commission uh, owns it and um, is going through the process of figuring out what to do. The, the platform is shut in. That is, all of the, the wells have been uh, uh, capped with, with concrete. The uh, original owners were ex is was actually mobile, but now Exxon Mobil, and they've spent I've been told uh, uh, uphill of three hundred million dollars um, in the, in the process of of shutting in uh, the platform. 
the um, all the platforms off California are made out of steel. Uh, and as I mentioned before, all of them look the same underwater, except for Eureka. Um, all the platforms have uh, cylindrical uh, pilings that are uh, anchored below the mud line. They have cylindrical cross beams uh, that, that are uh, either around the perimeter of the platform or are diagonal uh, within it. And then all of the conductors, the, the pipes that actually uh, uh, carry the oil or gas, and, and some platforms um, produce both, um, are also um, uh, cylindrical. So they're actually rather simple underwater, um, which will, will uh, play into what lives there in a moment. So those are the folks who uh, funded uh, this research. I, I, I go to great lengths to be transparent about that because there is so much uh, emotion involved with, with the whole subject. Um, so uh, basically, oh, 80% of my funding came from the Minerals Management Service and the US Geological Survey. And then about 20% of my funding came from uh, an NGO, California Artificial Reef Enhancement Program, which was totally funded by, by Chevron. So uh, basically about 20% of, of all of my funding since 95 uh, was laundered uh, oil company money. And I, and I bring that up because uh, there's at least one person, one well-known anti-decommissioning uh, uh, person or anti-rigs to reef person who ha has said more than once that um, I'm a shill for the oil company because my funding comes from the oil company and therefore you can't trust my my research, uh, my response always, well, I have two responses. One of them is, well, uh, if 20% of, of my research you know, is bogus, that's not bad, 80%, shoot. Uh, that's a B you know, if you're in, in school, so that's pretty good. And the other thing is almost all the research we've ever done is videotaped. And a lot of it is just like you go down and you count the fish and then you have a video record. And I always say, well, if you don't believe, you know, believe our data, you can come in and I'll hand you a, a beer and you can count, you know, you can spend the next eight or nine months counting the fish yourselves. Um, the other thing, again, in the interest of transparency is that I wear two hats where uh, platforms are concerned. I wear the biologist hat, Milton Love biologist, and then Milton Love citizen. And Milton Love Biologist is, is neutral. I mean, I give the same results, the same data to everyone. I don't really care where you stand philosophically. There are people who just want platforms removed. There are other people who go like, well, these seem like fully functioning reefs. Why are we blowing them up? Two extremes and then people in between. I give the same, the same data to everyone. And as far as you know, what to do with platforms when they're being decommissioned, I I actually have no opinion professionally. You 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 have the data. You guys decide. On the other hand, as a citizen, I do have a view, and I always tell people what my view is. And that is, as you will see, um, there are tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of uh, invertebrates that live on the platforms, um, mussels and and sea stars and nudibranchs and all kinds of things. And when you remove the platform, uh, you kill them all. And uh, I just think that's immoral. Uh, and basically, you're, you, you know, you're killing them for making a bad career move and, and landing on a piece of steel instead of settling out on a, on a rock. But hopefully that doesn't influence, uh, influence the, the research, hopefully. So when we first started in 95, we were given kind of a mandate, what fishes around uh, live around platforms of California, and importantly, over our, uh, nearby natural reefs. And that's really important. It's one thing to go down and go like, oh, look at all the fish we saw at a platform or, or the fish we didn't see at a platform. <clears throat> but if you don't know what lives around the nearby reefs, you don't have any kind of frame of reference. So uh, we, we tried to do all of our surveys, uh, both at, at as many platforms as we could, and as many uh, uh, reefs in California as, as we had funding for. And then the other question we were asked to address is the question of production versus aggregation. 
So if you see a bunch of fish at a platform or you see a bunch of fish at a natural reef, um, did the platform or reef produce those fish? Are there more of those fish in say Southern California because of that reef? Or did they merely, are the fish there and they had swum from someplace else? In other words, they, won't cre they weren't created because of that structure. They were uh, just, uh, uh, you, you basically reassembled them in the system. So one is aggregation and that is not necessarily a positive or negative thing. And the other is production. They're actually more of a species of fish. Uh, and, and that can be viewed, depending on your frame of reference, as a, as a benefit. So we were asked to kind of look at that also. So here's what a platform looks like uh, close by. It has an intertidal zone that is similar in uh, uh, the species that live there to uh, a rocky intertidal, um, basically covered in, in mussels. And in fact, this this uh, muscle coverage goes down to 50, 60, 70 feet, uh, and then uh, uh, alters. And th this is true of, of natural uh, reefs too, that depth is the great driver of what you find, both fishes and invertebrates and, and, and algae. Uh, things change as you go, as you go deeper. So there's a, a, a look at uh, kind of uh, underwater, but not too far underwater. Um, uh, lots of strawberry anemones that are on top of the mussels. Those, all of those vertical structures you see are the conductors that conduct the, the oil and gas. Uh, we see uh, other things other than fishes and uh, invertebrates. Uh, cormorants, for instance. I, uh, a lot of my work used a two-person sub submarine and um, I've been down in 180, 200 feet of water and a bird will come right by the porthole and it's just, you almost lose control of your sphincters. It's like, holy moly, what was what was that? And uh, they're down feeding on, on the small fishes around the platform. You've probably seen this, lots and lots and lots of uh, Cal mainly California sea lions that are uh, either on the buoys near platforms or on the lower landings. These will actually uh, walk up the catwalk uh, two or three stories and all of the platforms now have gates that uh, uh, prevent the sea lions from coming up because they tend to be uh, quite aggressive and, and they'll try to bite uh, people working on, on the platforms. So these are uh, kind of a look at the invertebrates living on the on the jacket. The jacket is the, the steel uh, structure underwater. Uh, lots of strawberry anemones covering these, these mussels. Uh, Metridiums, the, the big uh, white uh, uh, anemones that become more abundant the deeper you go. Uh, lots of new all kinds of everything would kind of on died in the the massive epidemic that that came through a number of years ago that extended from Baja California to Alaska and uh almost all of these paisasters died uh and are I, I'm not even say that they're slowly coming back I'm not even sure that that's true off off our area but there are still some left, but not very many, but there used to be huge numbers feeding on those on those mussels. And you get uh, barnacles and the like. When you get into deeper water, the mussels disappear and you start getting uh, sponges, you start getting uh, corals, not the tropical corals, but you get the temperate water and cold water corals that look like uh, flocked Christmas trees, for instance, or, or gorgonias that look like fans and, and the like. That's a uh, California king crab living in. This is platform gale, which sits in about 740 feet of water. And that's the bottom. You notice that cross beam there, all platforms are built so they have a cross beam right at the seafloor or near the seafloor. And that turns out to be quite important uh, in determining what fishes uh, live around a platform. We'll talk about that anon. And then around all platforms are shells. And these uh, are primarily mussel shells that have fallen off the platform, off the shallow parts, and have either fallen off during gales, which uh, will knock the, the mussels off, or during cleaning. All the oil industry uh, cleans their platforms off California down to about, oh, 40 to 60 feet. They basically have divers go down and with higher pressure hose, high pressure hoses, they blast all the shells off. 
to reduce the amount of drag on, on the structure, and all these shells fall to the bottom. If the, if the platform is shallow enough, it forms, they, they kind of immediately sink. The current doesn't carry them away. And you wind up with these shell mounds that can be uh, a hectare or acres in, in size and, and can be uh, eight or 10 or 15 feet deep of, of shells that are all kind of eventually fused. So you actually can't uh, move the shells. They're all fused, fused together. And on those shell mounds, you have a whole separate uh, community of invertebrates uh, again, this is a gale and 740 feet. These are all uh, baby rock crabs, all about the size of a of a half dollar. And so again, you have a uh, question yes. from Kim. Are all of the shells dead, the ones that get knocked off? It depends on the depth. If if uh, if you go down to Eva or Emmy uh, off Huntington mm -hmm. Beach, I should I should have said this. So platforms range in depth off California from about 30 feet approximately down to about 1,200 feet. And the shallowest platforms are the ones that are off Huntington Beach in I, I, you know, 40 feet of water, something like that. And if, if the shells fall there, um, they, they survive. If you fall into 1,200 feet of water, um, you're not adapted. It's mainly a, a becomes a temperature uh, issue and, and eventually those die. So it depends on, on the depth. I don't know the maximum depth you can drop a a muscle in before it it dies and in some cases if you drop it deep enough there's not enough plankton for them to feed on so um the shallow ones yes they're all alive the deeper ones no they're all dead and spot prawns so those are all the the kind of uh, uh typical invertebrates you see on this very unique habitat uh the shell mount so uh, we did two kinds of surveys around platforms that is using two techniques. One, we did scuba divers who basically uh, uh, dove along the cross beams inside and outside the, the uh, platform jacket uh, you know, with waterproof paper. And they just uh, counted all of the fish they saw within a, a two meter on each side band. So those are called belt transects. So basically you count uh, everything that is two meters on one side of you, two meters on the other, and from the substrate, two meters up. So it's it's a three-dimensional belt. Uh, anything that is outside that, you don't count. It, it's as if they don't exist. So we had, had divers uh, do that down to about 120 feet of water. And then below it, we use this two-person submarine. And this is the Delta. We used another one a little bit. But this was the pride and joy of the year for all of us in the lab because getting to go into really deep water is a, a almost unique experience. And uh, I don't know, I had 150, 180 dives over the years in, in this thing all the way down to 1200 feet. And then in another one uh, down into, hold on, I'm, I'm translating down to about 1800 feet in uh, another sub we used for a while. Basically the, the um, People, I assume, can see my cursor. Uh, the pilot sat amidships and looked out these ports. The observer uh, was in the bow and looked out a port. Here's that port. There was a video camera. We used Hi8 for a long time and then eventually a digital camera. There was a microphone right next to our mouth here. So anything we saw, we video camera was a ruby laser. So when we looked out into the water, we saw two red points and we knew those points were 20 centimeters apart. And we used that to train our eyes so that we could make an estimate of every single fish we saw. We identified every single fish again in a belt and uh, estimated uh, its length. And we actually tested how good we were at this by uh, uh, putting out uh, plastic fish uh, you know, that were attached to a polypropylene line outside Anacapa in about 80 feet of water. We went along and, uh, and uh, estimated the length of every single one of these plastic fish we saw. And it turned out that we were pretty good. I was actually kind of freaked out about that possibility, but it turned out like, okay. So there's um, one of the platforms off Summerlin and there's the Delta, just to give you an idea, kind of frame of reference for for size, platforms come in a variety of sizes. As you would imagine, the older, shallower ones are small-ish. The larger, older ones or younger ones are 
are humongousoid. I mean, whatever you think of the oil industry or burning fossil fuels or global warming uh, aside, as engineering feats, they're actually quite amazing. The fact that they don't fall over instantly is like, huh, holy moly, how, how is that possible? And, uh, and they're very, very big when you're either in the little sub next to them or on them. Some, some of them are 14, 18 stories tall. So that's case. That's basically how we uh, did the surveys. We went down uh, a leg of a platform. We went out, uh, hold on. So should I do this in feet or in meters? A, a show of hands, I don't care. Do you, are people most comfortable if I talk in feet? Just yes, yeah, no, no one cares. Yes, okay, we'll, we'll talk in feet. So people would, uh, so the, the sub would go out about 20, 30 feet from the platform on the shells and then go all the way around. And basically that was a shell mound transect. So we uh, identified all the fish we saw from our eye out two meters and from uh, the seafloor up uh, three, uh, up three meter, uh, two meters. And um, that was our belt. We then went to the base of the platform and there was often a cross beam, but not always. We would go all the way around and do a transect, we go up to the first cross beam, second, third, and so forth. The deeper cross beams like Eureka will have uh, uh, 10 or 12 cross beams. So the, the process on these deeper platforms took, oh, maybe three hours. You, you did not drink liquid before you went into that uh, little sub. There's all the platforms off California. All the ones that have stars are the platforms that we have uh, surveyed at least once. And in many cases, we have surveyed them eight or, or 10 times over the years, starting in 1995. The uh, platforms that are uh, green dots, even Emmy, those are too shallow for uh, our sub. And so uh, Chris Lowe's group at Long Beach State, he uh, surveyed the fishes there. Uh, Gina, I think we did it on scuba. And then this one, Heritage, I don't know, man. So these three platforms are all owned by ExxonMobil. And uh, that's a historically been a very tough um, oil company to deal with. Each oil company, and I had no idea this was true, had it has a, its own corporate personality, and some of them are easier to work with than others. And I remember when I first started in '95, I just randomly called the operator of Irene up here above Arguello, and I explained what we wanted to do. And uh, you know, it'll take 45 minutes to go around your platform and count fish. And John Deacon, the owner, or not the owner, the operator said, okay. And I went, well, this is easy, man. And uh, I remember Chevron, which ran these, it took a little convincing, but they went, okay, fine. And uh, then I talked to ExxonMobil and they went, no. And I explained it and explained it. And, and, and our lawyer from UCSB explained to their lawyer and finally, your lawyer said, what part of no don't you understand? And uh, it took years to get, get permission to dive around their platforms. And th for some reason, they, they just never, they never said yes. But I don't know if they're like, uh, you know, uh, producing fentanyl there. I don't know what they're doing, but we never got uh, permission. But you can see that we, we have surveyed almost all the platforms um, off of California. And we've surveyed a large number of natural reefs. All of these dots are uh, rocky areas. And uh, basically, we uh, went as far out on the continental shelf as you can go before it drops off uh, into the slope and the abyss. And so we we covered an awful lot of, of um, natural reefs, not any here. It's a long way to go. Santa Barbara and takes a lot of money. These these um, vessels cost a lot of money and the subs do. But we have a pretty good frame of reference of what lives on natural reefs and what lives on platforms. And that's the take home message. And that is that no, not all platforms uh, are created equal. And in fact, every platform has a slightly different uh, fish community, which would be totally expected because uh, every single reef, natural reef, has a, a slightly different fish community. Uh, it has to do with how com complex the reef is, what depth it's in, what part of the Southern California bite it's in, random occurrences, all kinds of, of stuff. On the other hand, if you held a gun to my head and said, well, you have to generalize about what the fish populations are like. So 
here's what the fish populations are like around California platforms. First thing is that we see pelagic fishes, schooling pelagic fishes. What do we see? We see uh, sardines, we saw, see jack mackerel, Pacific mackerel, we see um, anchovies, but these fishes are not associated with the platform. If the platform were not there, th that school would still be just traveling through. So we we see them, but they're not uh, uh, important as far as the, the platform assemblage uh, is concerned. And then in the shallow parts of the platform, as those of you who have gone out to like Eureka and uh, Edith and, and uh, Ellen and so forth, um, we see uh, typical um, nearshore reef fishes. So in this case, uh, Garibaldi, and there's blacksmith in there, and sheephead. Curiously, we see uh, a lot of pipefish, even though there's no kelp, there's almost no algae, but pipefish kind of like it. Um, and, and, and so uh, with a few exceptions, it, it, the upper parts, say the top 100 feet, uh, have fish assemblages that are, uh, if not identical, extremely similar to uh, uh, near shore reefs in, in the vicinity. The biggest difference, oh, oh, I'm sorry, and there's also cabazon, here's a cabazon guarding uh, eggs. By the way, the uh, eggs, most of you probably know, are really, really toxic if you eat them. In nature, the general principle is if something is brightly colored, there's a reason for it. It's not just aesthetics on Gaia's part. Uh, they're usually dangerous in one way or another. And in the case of cabazon eggs, no one eats them as far as, well, I, I think crabs may, but very few things eat them. If you go up to uh, British Columbia in the rocky intertidal, where the uh, cabazon lay eggs in the uh, intertidal zone at high tide, as the tide leaves, the the adults, uh, which normally guard the eggs, they uh, they leave and you, you find the eggs high and dry and there are uh, martins and there are minks and uh, all kinds and ravens, nobody is eating those eggs. So the, clearly the word has gotten around. So this is the difference. This is the biggest difference between a typical platform and a typical natural reef in Southern California. And that is in many years at most platforms, there will be very high densities of young fishes mainly rock fishes, but including blacksmith and painted gringling and other things. Very high densities in some years. In some years, uh, almost none. Uh, why, is, why is there such huge variability? Well, before these, uh, these are Boccaccio and overfished rockfish species. Before these, each one of those fish was at the platform, it was drifting around the plankton. And bad things can happen to you if you're a fish larvae drifting around the plankton you can be carried offshore, you can starve to death, you can be eaten. And in some years, that's what happens to almost every single larvae. And you wind up with almost no juveniles uh, recruiting to anything, not just platforms, but to natural reefs. Um, and that's what happens at platforms. Some years, uh, you'll see a lot of these young fish. Other years, you won't. We'll be talking about this over and over again. So I want to um, give you uh, a, uh, what an acronym means. So I'm gonna be talking about young of the year, yois, Y-O-Y. Yois are any fish that's younger than a year, okay? Think of them as like babies, all right? So this is this is what you can see in a, if you wanna think about it, a good year at a platform, uh, hundreds of thousands of these uh, young fish, most of them at platforms are going to be rock fishes of about six or eight species, but there are young of the year of, of other species. So that's the midwaters. When you get down the bottom, you get a different group of fishes, mainly larger ones, often older ones. Um, these are, uh, well, I used to think they were vermilion rockfish, which the fishermen call red snappers that are uh, not snappers, but that's what the fishermen call them. Um, uh, now it turns out there's two species and they're almost impossible to tell apart from a photograph, but, but let's just call them uh, vermilion rockfish. So you get these schools of vermilion rockfish around the base of the platform. These are um, flag rockfish uh, found at platform Grace in the middle of the Santa Barbara Channel. And um, th these must be uh, either ter not territorial, but sedentary because every single year we, we went to Grace on the same side of the platform, there would be all these uh, flag rockfish. So 
It's probably the same fish uh, over and over again. Uh, these are Boccaccio. I mentioned the young of the year Boccaccio. These are adults. Boccaccio in uh, the 90s were down to about, I think about 7% of their unfished level. They were officially overfished as designated by the federal government. They put the kiboshki on catches of Boccaccio. Essentially, you couldn't you couldn't catch a Boccaccio for years at a time uh, because the population was so low. And uh, during the, that really rough period, the highest densities of, uh, of adult Boccaccio we, we saw anywhere was at this one platform, uh, Platform Gale. And a more extreme case, this is a Calcad, which was down to about 3% of its unfished level. And again, the highest densities uh, were found at uh, Platform Gale. I have a... Uh, I love uh, Calcad. I have a tattoo of a Calcad. I have a, a ring. I had a jeweler make that uh, a jade ring in the shape of a Calcad. Uh, uh, my wife has essentially said no more Calcad art for the house. So I have to put it in my lab. So that's the base where you get a lot of adult fish um, and uh, or, or, or older or at least older fish. On the shell mounds, uh, there's not a lot of places to hide. And a lot of these fishes like to hide at night. And so you get a lot of fish, but they tend to be, the even the adults tend to be small. They're dwarf species. This is a half-banded rockfish on, on a shell mound. And um, a half-banded on, on like steroids is like a foot long. That's as big as they get. And uh, the reason that you have basically small fish around these shell mounds is there's not a lot of hidey holes. Uh, the, the biggest hidey holes will be two big mussel shells that happen to fall and create a, a little crevice, but it's not big enough for a, a 20 pound calcot or a 15 pound boccaccio. So you tend to get a lot of uh, a very small fish and a lot of juvenile fish. This is a baby calcot, maybe uh, three inches long, found uh, again, found on the shells. And I should mention that the pipelines that carry the oil and gas are also covered in marine life. I mean, basically the premise in marine systems is anything you put down will eventually be home to something. Um, if you go to the uh, to um, King Harbor, to the pier at Redondo, there's a, a submarine canyon that comes right into, almost into King Harbor. And if you stand on that pier, and apparently a lot of people used to do this, and you throw a beer bottle as far as you can in front of that pier, it'll land in about 90 feet of water. <clears throat> and we had divers who would go down there when I was at Occidental College. And almost every single beer bottle had a sarcastic fringe head, those little fish in it, or a, an octopus. And you know they didn't care that it wasn't a natural reef. It, was, it, it worked for them. So you can put an inner tube down, and there'll be fish. And so it, it really doesn't matter uh, what you put down. Some marine organism or group of organisms will, will call it home. So um, I'm not gonna flog this, this comparison between flat platforms and reefs, but we have tons of data. And uh, basically to summarize, uh, platforms have slightly different fish assemblages on average uh, than reefs. So what are the big differences? Well, one big difference is that platforms act as de facto marine reserves or preserves. Uh, that is, they weren't created to protect fish from fishermen. But they, over time, that's, that's kind of how they act. The, um, it turns out there's very, very little fishing that goes on around most platforms, not all of them. The platforms off of Long Beach, uh, particularly Edith and a couple of the others, their party boats will go right up next to them and fish. So it doesn't work there as much, but you, you start going um, north and west <clears throat> to the channel, or up above uh, conception. And there's almost no fishing. And particularly after 9-11, the oil industry got very squirrely about unknown boats coming right up next to them and started calling the Coast Guard or taking a fire hose and chewing people away. So they, the, um, the platforms are acting as no take areas or semi no take areas. So you tend to wind up with bigger uh, individuals than you do at nearby natural reefs where fishing is allowed. So just to, to frame this, we're looking at uh, Boccaccio, this overfished species, and we're asking the question, well, where do we see adult, adult Boccaccio? 
and, and these are all the dives we, we did up to 2009. If there's an X, it meant there wasn't a single adult Boccaccio on, on the reef. Uh, these are all, by the way, reefs that should have adults. The, the habitat was the kind of habitat that adults like. And you can see it's mainly uh, Xs. Uh, the, closest, the closer to red you are, the higher the densities of adults. The highest was uh, Platform Gale that I mentioned before. Uh, another one was uh, Hidalgo up here. And then um, some of these uh, reefs that are out where it blows all the time uh, also had uh, fairly high densities. But there was this uh, uh, tendency for platforms to act as, as marine uh, uh, protected areas. So you tend to get uh, larger and, and more uh, of these fish at platforms than you do at natural reefs. So that's one big difference. And the other thing is uh, this, this nursery function. I mentioned that platforms tend to have, in some years, very high densities of young fish. So uh, over the years, we would uh, survey the fishes at this. So to, this to align you, here's Point Conception, Point Arguello, Santa Barbara is down here someplace, and, and you guys are even uh, further to the, to the east. We would go and take the little submarine, and we do surveys, fish surveys at Platform Hidalgo, and we do fish surveys at North Reef on the same day. And then we could compare the fish. And um, that was the comparison because you had no temporal differences in the survey, same day. The uh, uh, reef and the platform sit in about the same water depth. So you don't have any problem with differences in depth. Uh, they're in the same water mass. So uh, it's not like one is in cold water and one is hot water. So it was a really good comparison. So here's what we found. So just to uh, kind of align you to what we're looking at. We are looking at the density of young of the year fish. And it's we're talking primarily rock fishes, which by the way, dominate almost all the systems off California, some species of rock fish or another. Um, and, and so we're talking about a, a group of baby fish and their densities. The blue, the blue bars are the dense, the higher the bar is, the higher the density, uh, the blue bars are the platform, the red bars are, are the nearby reef. And the first thing you see is that there's a huge amount of variability uh, for, for any of these pairs uh, from year to year to year. And um, uh, 1999 was a good year at both places, but the previous year uh, kind of sucked, the next year kind of sucked. So as I say, there's a lot of oceanographic variability, which leads to good years and bad years for these young fish. So that's the first thing you see is you go here to here to here to here, lots and lots of differences. The other thing you can see is that the blue bar is always higher than the red bar. In fact, in a lot of cases, it's a lot higher, um, which uh, says that the densities of young fishes at Hidalgo, every single year we went there, were higher and sometimes much higher than at this nearby natural reef. Well, like, why is that? So it's probably not because the oil industry sprinkles their platforms with, with pixie dust and they're like magical places. The, the logical reason anyway, is if you look at the life history of these young fishes, they start out life as larvae or very small juveniles drifting around the plankton. And most of the time, they're 80, 100 feet, 150 feet below the sea. Don't have a lot of control over where they go. And at some point though, they go like, well, I'd like to settle out on something hard. Don't care what it is. And um, I'm just, I'm ready, right? So who are they more likely to encounter? The platform that covers the entire water column or the reef, which is about 10 feet tall and sits in about 420 feet of water. Well probably the, the platform. So there's just more opportunity in general, and, and this covers all of Southern California. There's more opportunity for a fish to encounter a platform when it's um, uh, being carried around in the plankton than uh, a natural reef. Does that mean that there's like no recruitment of young fishes to natural reefs? Absolutely not. There certainly is. But it does tend to mean that there's on average platforms, and I hate to use this term, but I'm going to quote unquote are better nursery grounds for some species of fishes than are 
uh, almost all natural reefs in, in Southern California. Not all of them. If you go out to San Miguel Island, there are, plat there are natural reefs that, that mimic platforms. They're, they're spires. They actually come up uh, uh, 60, 80, 100 feet off the seafloor. And those, those reefs do have good numbers in some years of, of young of the year fish. So this is what we see on, on a year with uh, heavy recruitment of young fish. Uh, this is when, and this is taken outside the, uh, just shoving a camera up to the porthole of the submarine. This is what we see, very, very high densities of fish in this particular year at this platform, platform Gilda in 2003, there were so many young fish, Boccaccios and Vermilions, that we couldn't see the platform in some places. There were just, and by the way, we went there the next year and there was almost zero uh, young fish. So there a lot of variability. So um, uh, very high densities and a very good nursery function in some years for some platforms. Um, so so uh, following that particular year, 2003, where we had these high densities of fish, I started thinking like, well, is this important to the to the species? Yeah, there's high densities, but you know maybe there's high densities everywhere of 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 Boccaccio, for instance. So <clears throat> people in my lab actually we estimated, well, how many did of these young fish do we actually see at Platform Grace? And doing magic, we came up with like three hundred fifty thousand, and Gilda, you know, forty thousand, all the way down to Platform A, where we didn't see a single one. But when we compiled it all, it was like 430,000 uh, estimated uh, baby Boccaccio just at these platforms. So I thought, well, that, that sounds like a high number, but like, is that really meaningful for the species as a whole, which, which really ranges from British Columbia to central Baja California? So I talked to Alec McCall, who uh, was at the National Marine Fisheries Service, and his job was to estimate the abundance of Boccaccio, this overfished species, that was, the, uh, he did the stock assessments. And I said, you know, Alex is 430,000 young of the year Boccaccio significant. And, and he had a computer program and he went, well, here it is. The abundance of little Boccaccio at these six platforms is 20% of the entire baby Boccaccio, of all the baby Boccaccio on the entire Pacific coast, 20%. So I'm going like, whoa, I mean, that sound again, not knowing very much, that sounded important to the species. And I said, well, how many adults does that turn into? Because that's the key. If all of those Boccaccio babies turn into like one adult because they all die, well, that's not very important. And of course he has a computer program for that. And he went, well, the, you know, it, 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 on average, those all of those babies would turn into uh, one percent of the additional amount of Boccaccio needed to rebuild the stock. So in that one year, those handful of platforms, according to his computer program, probably built the stock up ultimately one percent, which, no matter how you look at it, is important. Now, is that true for all species of fish? Absolutely not. Is that true for Boccaccio in every single year? Absolutely not. Is it true? Sometimes, probably so. This is all I got. But you can see that potentially for some species of fish, platforms are, are important. Well, here I am um, talking to, I think these are the CEOs of uh, the ma major oil companies. I think that's uh, the CEO of ExxonMobil. That could be Chevron Phillips. I know that's the platform. And, and you can see that uh, the oil industry was kind of happy uh, with my results. On the other end, here I am talking to members of the environmental community, and uh, they were not, they, they have not been enthusiastic over the years, which is profoundly ironic to me because, again, in the interest of transparency, I must say that I walk on the semi extreme left side of the street and semi extreme green side of the street. And so uh, people who should be my natural allies do not like, many of them, not all of them, do not like the results of my research because most of them are, are not in favor of retaining any part of a platform. And I think they're fearful of, of those results. 
And because of that, over the years, um, I've had a number of pushback, uh, 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 and not just from them, by the way, but from the academic community uh, about the results of my research. And what I'm going to do now is kind of encapsulate some of the uh, questions. Let's let's be polite. The questions that have arisen, and see how or if I I can address them regarding uh, my research. So the first one has to do with all those baby Boccaccio in 2003. Maybe there are little Boccaccio everywhere. So that's that's valid. So even though Alec McCall's uh, computer program said, well, uh, this is probably 20% of all the baby Boccaccio on the entire Pacific coast, uh, maybe that year was just a great year for baby Boccaccio. And they were on all the natural reefs in Southern, or a lot of the natural reefs in Southern California. Well, fortunately for me, I know lots of people who do fish surveys uh, on natural reefs. And I asked them that question, like, well, what are the densities of Boccaccio in your, your surveys? And uh, it was not a great year. So, I mean, that, that encapsulates it. All those zeros are places where uh, people like at PV, those are all rocky areas. And no one saw any baby Boccaccio there and Catalina and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there were some at some of the Channel Islands, but nothing like we saw at those, those platforms. So at least in that year for that species, the platforms were really where it was at as far as uh, reproductive uh, capacity. Again, is that true every year? I have no idea. Is that true for more than Boccaccio? I have no idea. If people want to give me more money, then I will answer that question. You fool, maybe they all die. Okay, so I was, uh, many years ago, I was at a, uh, a meeting at the Natural History Museum here. It was a symposium on the Channel Islands, on the fishes, invertebrates, algae. And I was uh, sitting next to Mark Carr, who's, uh, I think he just retired. I just talked to him. He's a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz and far more talented than I am. And, uh, but he was a grad student at the time. And he said, and I, and I said to him, we just got off uh, the cruise. Uh, uh, I must have seen 400,000 widow, widow rockfish. Widow is the name of rockfish. And I think that platform is, is producing uh, uh, widow rockfish. And he looked at me and said, how do you know that the next day, all of those fish aren't dead? And I remember thinking like, or I didn't just think, I, I looked at him, I said, screw you, Mark. Actually, I didn't say that. I said something more impolite than that, but you get the point. And I thought, how would I know? How could you know the fate of every little rockfish? I mean, that's, that's so how, how can I, you address that question? But then, turns out, nature provided me with a way of addressing this. Kind of a complicated figure, but you are adults, you'll be able to handle this. So again, we're looking at our Okay. Okay. This form. Again, this is the result of phase in, in 2006. All right. Uh, the higher the bar, the more of them we saw at these different sizes. Okay. Starting from the smallest on the left to the largest on the right. And you can see that in the first year, we didn't see any baby Boccaccio at all. They're all gone. 99 was a great year, but in fact, it was a great year at natural reefs, it, all up and down California. Oceanographic conditions were fabulous. So there was a lot of survivorship of young fishes, ling cods, all kinds of rock fishes, fabulous. So um, there was a whole bunch of, of uh, little Boccaccio right there, there they are. Came back the next year, not very many little ones, but whew, look at that. There's a whole bunch of slightly larger Boccaccio. Came back the following year. Hmm, look, slightly larger ones came back. Following year, whole bunch of ones that were slightly larger, slightly larger. And then in 2003, when you might expect them to come over here, they didn't. They were about the same size. So what happened there? First of all, the most likely hypothesis is that Generally, these are the same fish. Some of them died. I'm sure some of them were eaten, but it's the same year class, the same group of fish that uh, lived all the way up to here, down to and here. But why did they more or less stop growing? Well, 
This is about the time when Boccaccio uh, mature. And when fish mature, they shift their energy from growth to producing sperm and eggs. So um, there was probably some growth, but not enough for our methods to figure it out. So what does that mean? Well, th that helps address Marx, uh, you fool, they all die. They didn't all die. I mean, that's the, the most likely hypothesis. You can come up with other ones that are, are very unlikely, but possible that they recruited as uh, little ones here and they survived all the way here and now they're reproducing. Uh, again, is it, and by the way, here it's happening again. Here's that year class, year class, year class like that. Um, does, is this true for all platforms? Absolutely not. Is it true for all fish? No, it, but it does happen. That's the point. Maybe they're all stunted. And this was a good one because uh, you go down and let's say you see four or 500,000 baby blue rockfish, let's say, and you can, you can see that many. They're not feeding on stuff on the, on the platform. They're not picking amphipods or shrimp or whatever off the jacket. They are feeding on plankton. And so they're dependent on the density of plankton coming through. They're not going to leave the platform. They stay right in, in the shadow of it. And you could hypothesize that if you have whatever, 400,000 of these babies all feeding on plankton, some of them are not going to get enough to eat. And therefore, their growth rates will actually be retarded. And um, so what we did was we, uh, let's see, there you go. So we collected blue rockfish babies at two platforms and two uh, natural reefs. And we actually looked at their daily growth rates. These were all fish that were probably six months old. And you can actually figure out how fast they grow daily by taking their ear bones out and counting the daily rings. And if you guys want to talk about it sometime, happy to talk about it. And then we looked at their daily growth rates and we found out that statistically, again, the blue is the platform, red is the natural reef. Statistically, the platform fish grew slightly faster than the reef fish. But I think in, in biologically significant terms, it was a wash. It didn't, didn't make any difference as far as the, the species are concerned. So at least in this one study, again, that's all I've got, uh, the, the fish were not stunted at, at the platform. Maybe if the platform were not there, all of the baby Boccaccio would recruit to natural reefs. This is a good one, I have to admit. So basically think about it this way. You have a platform and the currents are sweeping by the platform, through the platform. They're carrying larvae with them. If the larvae are ready to settle out, the larvae leaves the current, gloms on to the, to the jacket, and the current keeps on going without that, that larvae. Well, what if that platform were not there? What if you remove the platform and the current just continued to take the larvae someplace? So the question is, would the current take the larvae to natural nursery grounds. How does one address that? Okay, so here's, um, uh, the university has something called CODAR, CODAR system. So CODAR is a kind of radar that you point at the sea surface and it shows you the surface currents. You can actually plot them second by second or instant by instant, watch them continually. And uh, there was a, a, a couple of, um, of uh, transmitters at one in Conception, one in Arguello. That uh, area that is in uh, gray, that's the area that was covered. You notice that there is a platform there, Platform Irene. Uh, we did lots of surveys there. It had lots of uh, young of the year rockfishes. And basically we did a, a, a computer simulation of what would happen if currents that swept into Irene and we're carrying fish. If you removed Irene, where would the currents carry the, the juveniles? So you can you can do this a billion times if you want. You 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 just put these these uh, digital uh, fish or or drifters, whatever you want to call them, uh, into the currents, and and basically you were only interested in, in ones where the current carried them into the platform. You can do that until you know the cows come home. And, and so the rules are, 
We only used those times of the month when currents would be carrying the babies. We, um, the rules were if the currents carried the, um, the little drifters inshore, then we, then the fish, little babies survived, which is al almost always not true, but that was the rule. On the other hand, if, if the currents carried the little, um, digital babies offshore, then they died, which would have been true. And so what were the results? Well, we did it for three years running and we found that if the platform had not been there in 72% of the cases, the current would have carried these uh, pretend juvenile fishes offshore. Again, is this true in every year at Irene? I have no idea. We only have three years. Is it true for other platforms? I have no idea. We didn't have enough money to do any, any place else. But the implication is that at least for this platform, the fish we see at the platform, the babies, many of them would not have survived if that platform was not there. Maybe when the young Boccaccio Oliva platform, they all die a terrible, terrible death. So um, there are a number of rock fishes that will come as, as babies. The platform is nursery ground. You come by, you come the next year and they're all gone. Uh, they, they have swum away. It's not that, that they've been, been eaten probably or caught. They have swum away. Why have they swum away? Because the water depth is not deep enough for them. A lot of fish will uh, recruit as, as young to kelp beds or to shallow reefs. And after about a year, they go like, this is too shallow. And they start swimming into deeper water. And in some cases, considerably deeper water. Boccaccio will recruit to piers, they'll recruit to kelp beds. And after six or eight or 10 months, they're gone. And by the time they're about two years old, they'll be in 250 feet of water. And by the time they're 10 years old, some of them will be in 600, 800 feet of water. So uh, on most platforms, when you see little Boccaccio babies, or you see baby widow rockfish or some of the others, they're only there for six or eight or 10 months. And then they're gone, they swim away. So how do you know that those fish don't die? And, and never find a natural reef. Well, fortunately for us, the California Department of Fish and Game tested that hypothesis. They went to platforms A and B off, off Summerlin, there's Santa Barbara and Ventura, and they hook and lined uh, Young of the Year Boccaccio, brought them up and stuck a tag in their backs and tossed them back in the water. So if, for those of you who haven't seen uh, these, these typical anchor tags or, or dart tags, basically think of uh, a piece of, they're actually called spaghetti, a piece of uh, sp uh, plastic spaghetti, usually brightly colored. On it is printed the name of whoever did the tagging, California Department of Fish and Game, and a phone number and a tag number, 072, okay? And then you throw them back in the water, you hope that they survive, and you hope that, that someone catches them later. Could be the next day, could be 10 years later, and calls you and says, oh, I caught 072 here. And you go, oh, look, we tagged them over there and they went over there. And you can see from the arrows, these are some of the results of where the Boccaccio, which were caught then as adults years later, where they went, they scattered all over the place. So at least some of the fish that left the platform uh, did not die. So, you know, maybe all these fish are heavily polluted at platforms. And, and that's, that's reasonable on, on first principles. Platforms are not places that produce cotton candy. Platforms are industrial facilities. And with all that that means, that the, the potential for, um, uh, for there to be pollutants uh, that uh, uh, come from the platform is, is quite high. Um, where, what are the major sources of potential pollutants? Well, basically there are two, two sources, major ones. The first one is the lubricants that are used uh, when they're drilling. Uh, you, you have to lubricate the bits, you use what's called drilling mud. Historically, not anymore, but historically those uh, lubricants were, had very high levels of things like cadmium, heavy metals. Uh, not, not anymore, they still have some, but not much anymore, but they did at one time. That's one thing. And the second thing is what's called produced water. When you bring up oil and gas, uh, uh, often uh, water comes up with it. 
what do you what do you do with the water? Well, sometimes you pump it to shore, and other times it's released uh, into the water column from the platform. And the produced water has uh, all kinds of heavy metals uh, with it. So it's a reasonable hypothesis to think that uh, animals, not just fish, but invertebrates living around platforms, uh, are more heavily polluted with some of these pollutants than the same species away from the platform. So um, uh, to that effect, the-, hey, the Can I ask you a yeah. question, please? Sure. So a lot of divers um, and people collect scallops off the platforms. Uh -huh. Do you see a problem with that? If there are these pollutants that may be lingering around? Uh, only for sure, only at Platform Holly and uh, off the campus. Why is that? Platform Holly sits in a massive natural seep or series of natural seeps. Lots and lots of uh, crude oil comes up, barrels come up every single day. When, uh, when that oil uh, is broken down by a bacteria, you're left with um, uh, these organic compounds, uh, benzoalpha pyrenes and PAHs, and those do get into the muscles. Um, the highest levels, uh, they're, 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 I don't know if they still have it, but the, the California used to have what's called muscle watch, where they take muscles from all up and down the coast and test them for pollutants. And the highest levels ever found were um, in the coal oil point area, uh, in, the, in the inner tidal, uh, not just at the platform. And so I wouldn't eat anything off of that platform. The other ones, uh, particularly once drilling is done with, and I don't know if there's any drilling at all going on. I think it's all production. Uh, I don't, there probably is not a problem, but there hasn't been, a, as far as I know, and this is out of my area, I don't think there's been a lot of testing. So I, I don't know, but I have a feeling it's not an issue, but I don't want my ass sued by somebody that, you know, comes down with the mumps because they ate a, a rock scallop or something. Sure. Um, but that was, that's an excellent question without, a, a, I think, a real answer. So we looked at fish and we looked at two species of fish primarily. We looked at a sand dab that sits on the bottom, eats uh, bottom oriented things next to the platform, thinking like, well, if something's gonna be uh, in, ingesting pollutants or even coming in contact with pollutants in the sediment, it's gonna be like a sand dab. And then we also used um, kelp rockfish. And there's evidence that once a kelp rockfish uh, recruits to a platform, it like never leaves. So, you know, it, it, the fish we caught were probably five, six, eight years old. And uh, then we, this was funded by the, the feds. So we sent it to a federal lab, uh, testing lab in Missouri. And they came back and basically there was no statistical difference in any of the, I can't remember, it was like 28 different elements, particularly the ones people were most concerned about, mercury and cadmium and, and some of these others. There was no statistical difference between uh, a kelp rockfish taken at the platform and a kelp rockfish taken at uh, Santa Cruz Island in a kelp bed or, or w whatever. And again, this is all we've got. And uh, if someone wants to go out and redo the work and, uh, and use uh, rock scallops or, or anything, that'd be great. It would be, it would be fun to see uh, if, if there were any differences. But right now, as far as we know, uh, at least at these platforms, there didn't seem to be a pollutant problem for those, those specific pollutants. Okay. Hey, I just want to be courteous to our crowd. Um, it is 610. Can you give us uh, an idea of where you're at? I'm uh, three minutes away from finishing. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So one last slide and then a summary. So um, this is a slide that talks about uh, productivity at platforms, secondary productivity, which is a metric that is used all over the world in any aquatic system that that uh, and it's 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 a way of comparing uh, how important a habitat is for, in this case, fishes. So uh, the highest fish productivity in the world up until our study was in estuaries, Chesapeake Bay or coral reefs. Uh, and everybody's going like, whoa, really high productivity. And then one of our group, Jeremy Clace, uh, said, well, how about at platforms? Let's take a look. And it turned out that the, the least productive, and that's down here, least productive platform 
was higher, had higher productivity than any uh, natural uh, habitat ever described. And that's because productivity is, is a metric of, of how fast fishes are packing carbon on. The smaller your fishes and the more of them, the more carbon they're packing on. Platforms having all of these young fishes, the fishes are just packing on carbon, so they have like really high uh, productivity. So here are this is the summary slides. In broad terms, there are two fish assemblages, one in the midwater, one at the base and the associated shell mound. The water column of many platforms, but not all, serve as uh, nursery grounds primarily for rockfish, but for other things too. Young of the year rockfish densities around May platforms are greater than those on most natural reefs. Some platforms act as de facto marine reserves. Not all, but some. As with natural reefs, uh, platforms both produce and aggregate fishes. If you told me the most important fish in my life is, is a kelp bass, are kelp bass uh, producing, or, or platforms producing kelp bass, I'd say no, they're not. If you said, oh, I love rockfish, are they producing rockfish? I'll go like, yeah, depends on the species, but yeah. On average, fish around platforms and natural reefs are neither more uh, nor less uh, contaminated than fishes around natural sites. And uh, California oil and gas platforms are among the most productive marine habitats uh, in the world. All right, gang, there you go. A sea of sullen faces. You have any questions? Yes. Oh, that was excellent. A, a, a bunch of people pretending to clap. That I love that. <laughs> My ego demands that stuff. Okay. So, uh, uh, I mean, seriously, like questions, thoughts, or thoughts? Nothing. How do we? That, does the depth of the platform change that productivity number? Is it depth? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the oh, most productive yeah. parts, the most productive parts uh, are probably the top. Uh, say 300 feet. So below that you have mainly, either you have very few fish or you have very large fish. So your your productivity would not be near as high. It's it's a so shallow water phenomenon. Is it, because obviously you have more structure. So- You have more structure that, and you that have- that dilute more. the productivity, so to speak? No, no. The more structure, in, on our platforms, the more structure, the more opportunity to have small fishes. So yeah, it doesn't dilute it. By the way, um. People have talked about, well, why not keep a platform intact above the water and, and do things there? And um, first of all, so the, one of the major reasons is it's really expensive to maintain a platform. It costs about $400,000 a year to uh, maintain a platform. And a lot of that is you have to put these huge zinc plates underwater so that the zinc rusts away before the, the steel does. And second, you, you basically have to man them or woman them or person them. Uh, there have to be foghorns, there have to be lights. Coast Guard gets like really squirrely. If, if, a, platform, if a platform is cut shallow or shallower than 85 feet, the Coast Guard goes, oh man, you're gonna have to put a buoy on it and a buoy with a light and a buoy. We don't want a super tanker hitting your remnant of a platform. So first of all, it's very expensive. The second thing is it's very hard to get on and off a platform for me, let me put it that way. And so when people say, let's have a restaurant out there or a casino out there, uh, it's not like stepping onto a boat or uh, you know, walking to uh, Harrah's in Reno. Um, there's only three ways you can get on a platform. You can take a helicopter, which is really expensive, which is dependent on weather and which is you know, occasionally dangerous. So that's the first thing. No one talks about doing that routinely. I've done it. It's the fun way, but I, you don't want to do it routinely. Second is that there's a landing right at the at the waterline, and hanging from the landing is a big rope. And so people come up, and the skipper puts the fantail of the vessel right up next to the platform, and the people on the platform swing the rope over to you, and you grab it, and then you swing yourself from a rocking, moving boat onto a stationary platform. People in the Gulf where this is done the most are injured all the time doing that. So that's two ways. And the other one is my least favorite, the Billy Pew, which is named after Mr. Billy Pew, amazingly enough. Think of a big cargo net 
And at the base of the cargo net, there's a steel ring attached. And when I went out to Gale one time and they said, oh, you're gonna take the billy pew up. And I knew what the billy pew was. I'm going like, oh, so I go inside. They go like, no, you hang on to the outside of this net and we're gonna raise you 14 stories up. And I go like, oh, with the safety belt. They go like, no, there's no safety belt. You just have to put your legs, your feet on that ring and clasp yourself through the mesh. And that it was, I've done that three or four times. It was like the worst experience. I don't like heights other, higher than about four feet. And to be wafted 140 feet up is, is no good. But the, the point is that when people say, we could have a research station on a platform. Yeah, you could, but there are so many factors mitigating against it that that ain't gonna happen. I mean, it's just the university, as soon as their lawyers figured out what's going on, they go like, there's no way, Jose, <laughs> go try something else, my God. Anyway, so that's the reason that that the default for decommissioning here anyway, tends to be total removal or partial removal. Yeah. Why aren't there more um, rigs open and available to dive? You know, the only one's really- Oh, it's open. a liability issue. Yeah, the, the, the oil company is deathly afraid of, of accidents. Uh, if you are diving uh, around a platform and you die, who are your parents gonna sue? The state? Absolutely not. The state has no liability for this. No, it's the oil company. And if the oil company goes like, well, you you signed a release. Well, releases mean nothing in this country. So uh, uh, it, it's almost entirely a liability issue. What if a, a worker on the platform drops a wrench on you by accident? Oh, well, now we're going to sue your ass. So, um, And that's actually one of the reasons that we're not sure what's going to happen to platforms off California because the oil industry says publicly, you know what, when we're done, we're not gonna hold liability here. Liability has to go to somebody else. How about you, State of California? And State of California so far has said, well, not us, oh no. And so right now there's kind of a, a, a standoff. The, the California might want uh, the jacket of a platform to act as a reef and the oil company might go like, yeah, great, that's fine. Uh, because they actually save money by not completely taking it out. But then there's this liability issue. Mm -hmm. And that that has not been uh, rectified yet. I'm surprised we're allowed to chew gum in uh, because of the liability problems. You'd think that gum <laughs> manufacturers go like, well, what if you choke? Sign this waiver. So what else we got? Anything else? Oh, somebody coming in. You're Any late. other questions? Oh, yeah. No. If you do, uh, you uh, more or less know where to reach me. I have no life. And I just sit here uh, waiting with my hands folded, uh, waiting for people to ask me questions so that I can pretend I'm still important. <laughs> Great presentation. My wife makes lot. sure. My wife makes sure that my ego is kept in check. I remember one time, uh, oh, this is years ago. Uh, I got an email from the American Fisheries Society, and they said, you won, you have been nominated, and, and you won our annual conservation award, and, and please come up to San Francisco, would you come up? And I'm going like, oh, yeah, and I, I come home, I swear to God this is true, I come home and I go like, Jane, I won the Carl L. somebody conservation award, and she looks at me and she said, you forgot to take the compost out this morning. That was her <laughs> response. And, and I started thinking that if Hitler had had a real wife instead of that girlfriend, he would never have invaded Poland. He would have come home and go, well, we're going to invade Poland. And his wife would have said, no way, you forgot to take the compost out. And <laughs> it would have been, he would have been shattered. Hey, um, Milton, I got to go to the bottom of Edith one day at uh, about 160 feet yeah. and I thought you know I was very excited and I thought wow I wonder what I'm going to see you know big shark or something you know and I got down there it was all sand yes well um we've we've gone around Edith we not me but one of my 
uh, colleagues, when we were doing a lot of sub work, I always tried to have the same person do the same platform over and over and over in the sub so that uh, there was no observer bias. And so Merritt McRae uh, did Edith three years, I think. And uh, so I've looked at the footage. There is a robust shell mound, but the current, the uh, prevailing current carries the shells away from one side and toward another. So there, there's a very large um, shell mound. In one year, one year we saw, he saw hundreds of scorpion fish uh, huh. on it, all around the shells, which uh, was probably the end of a spawning aggregation. Uh, scorpion fish, California scorpion fish, uh, um, create huge aggregations, hundreds or if not thousands of animals from about mm, June to about September. That's the spawning season. And then they disperse. So these uh, fish are not dispersed yet. So there were, th that was the highest density of scorpion fish any of us had ever seen since and, and before. It was remarkable. And then there were half banded rockfish. What else is there? Um, there it, it's not the most species rich um, shell mound. Uh, yeah, and there are fish there, but, but not to your to your point, it's like not like a paradise of fish. Yeah, it really does vary. It's kind of surprising. Um, you know, there wasn't a ton of fish on Eureka and even Ellie and Ellen recently. I was sort of surprised because I'd been there when there was a high density. Right. And uh, we noticed that too. Divers, other divers have noticed that, that it's it's seasonal. It's not like there's no fish in January or, or February. It's that the number of fish go way down. There's always a scattering of Garibaldi, uh, sheephead, opali, half moons, things, or chromus, uh, blacksmith. But the, the real numbers peak probably in August or September, which means that they're coming from someplace else. Hmm. And if you think about it, uh, uh, Eureka is in deep water. And so these fish are, are swimming from someplace cells over deep water, uh, which always amazes me. Um, like giant sea bass have been acoustically tagged at Catalina, and then the signal has been picked up at Anacapa. Mm -hmm. Like the these fish that you look at them, you go like, there's no way you're going to swim 10 feet below the surface or 100 feet below the surface between one island to another, but they do. And, and in fact, giant sea bass will go back and forth from Catalina to the mainland, for that matter. It's like, holy moly. Wow. It's just incredible. Well, just fascinating. Any yeah, last stuff. questions? Floor is open. Come off mute. Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Well, All I right. do want to thank Milton. It was fascinating as always. And uh, we do have his book for sale. It rarely goes for about $39.95. If you are interested and you attended today, you're welcome to shoot me an email or a text and I will sell it to you for 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, I I I, I don't I don't uh, want to pray in your sympathy, but I should add that my 43-year-old son is a farmer in Montana and uh I need to keep sending him money. Just he's the only Marxist farmer, I am sure, in Montana. And um, I, I periodically I have to send him funds just to keep his spirits up. So not not preying on your your empathy or anything, but just want to bring that up. Yeah. Thank All you. right. Well, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Yeah. This is great. Thanks. You're welcome. If you have any last minute any questions, any thank you. That was awesome. Presentations you'd like to see. <laughs> um, I will be posting this up on YouTube, David, if you want to see the rest of it. Um, it'll be up on our YouTube channel, probably not tonight, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah. And if you have any suggestions for other speakers or topics, um, would love to entertain any input. I'm happy to have you uh, just shoot me an email or a text. Um, we love doing this, and um, it riches our lives. I know that. I hit the wrong button. How about that? 
I think my recording stopped already. <laughs>